a los objetivos del negocio. A cargo del señor Philip Harrison, director de Seguridad de la Información del Fondo Monetario Internacional. Seguidamente, escucharemos la presentación de aspectos de supervisión financiera relacionados a ciberseguridad. A cargo de Thomas Gaidosh, experto en riesgo cibernético del Fondo Monetario Internacional. Al finalizar las presentaciones, tendremos un espacio para preguntas. Para dar inicio al evento, escucharemos las palabras del señor Diego Duarte, miembro del directorio del Banco Central del Paraguay. Muy buenas tardes para todos. Es un placer recibirlos a todos hoy aquí, a pesar de la copiosa lluvia que estamos teniendo. Eh, es un placer, como les decía, eh, tener esta, esta charla ofrecida amablemente por, por funcionarios del Fondo Monetario Internacional. En ese sentido, en nombre del directorio del Banco Central, me gustaría agradecerle agradecerles a Tamas y a Philips el tiempo que nos están dedicando en esta tarde. Yo creo que vale también la pena comentar que ambos funcionarios nos están, están apoyando al Banco Central en lo que hace a la revisión un poco de lo que es la estrategia en gestión de, de riesgos de seguridad de la información. ¿verdad? Desde el Banco Central estamos convencidos de que, de que eh, la seguridad de la información es algo absolutamente importante, clave, de, de tremendo valor reputacional para el banco y para el país. Entonces, desde ese punto de vista, a nosotros nos parece sumamente interesante contar con el apoyo de, de los especialistas en el área, que en un tiempo esta parte también han tenido oportunidad ya de de conocer y trabajar en varios otros países, varias regiones, eh, por, lo que, por lo que sabemos que en estas presentaciones que van a compartir ahora con nosotros, van a tratar un poco también de transmitirnos sus experiencias, los avances que han, que han visto en otros lugares y desde ese punto de vista también como país, como banco central, como sector financiero, eh, poder también eh, tener una, una suerte de idea de dónde estamos parados y hacia dónde deberíamos de, de dirigirnos. Bueno, sin mucho más que agregar, eh, nuevamente muchas gracias por, por compartir con nosotros este tiempo, por compartir con nosotros estas presentaciones que van a ser, eh, estamos seguros, sumamente interesantes para, para todos nosotros. Muchas gracias. Sin más, iniciaremos las presentaciones invitando al señor Philip Harrison a realizar su disertación. Hola. ¿Puedo oírme? Es muy bueno estar en Paraguay. Soy de Londres y veo que tengo el clima de Londres también. Bueno, ¿puedo oírme? Sí. So today, I'm hoping that we can talk about cybersecurity strategies that align to business objectives. <clears throat> so to give a little introduction uh, about myself, um, I've had a 30-year career in IT in financial services. The last 16 years have been in security for uh, large global investment banks and smaller investment, um, investment houses. Uh, I'm based in London, uh, but I've also had the opportunity to work in the United States, in Asia, and in Europe. And I hope some of my experience will help here in delivering this presentation. So what I'm going to talk about today, cybersecurity strategy. Uh, why we need it, 
look at some of the internal and external drivers for this. Um, and then look at some of the risks, threats, vulnerabilities, and the value of our information assets. And look at some of the frameworks we can consider, and also what should happen in the future. Uh, but I hope to do this and show you all the way through that you can be aligned to business objectives. Okay, so why? <clears throat> we really need to look at supporting our business strategy, supporting our business with what we do in cyber security. Um, it, you can also use it to help resource multi-year investment in cyber security. And it's very important as well that you're reporting up so your board, your management knows what's happening and how we are protecting our information assets and our cyber security. <clears throat> but to me, it's about managing the risk, managing the cyber security risk. And please, if, if the people who have just entered, if you want to come down and find a seat. Why is it about managing the risk? It's because it's not possible. It's not possible to completely secure all your assets. And so you have to manage the risk, in our case, the cyber security risk. But with good controls, we do have an advantage. Anybody who wants to attack us, they'll find other places easier to attack, so they can attack those places before they can attack us. If you've got good controls, good detective controls, they know that they're going to get caught. <clears throat> and they will find it too much effort to attack you if you do have good controls. But only for now, only until they get more sophisticated and, they can <clears throat> and their uh, methods of attack become stronger. So, it's always good to place this in context. Uh, we must reinforce the business with what we do. And if you want the support of your management, if you want the support of your board of directors, you have to align it with the business strategy and objectives of the, that we have in the business. Um, other areas that are important here are uh, risk appetite. The risk of appetite are the risks that the organisation will take in pursuit of the business goals, or will not take. And this is very important, this is set at a high level in the organisation, so we know how much, <coughs> how much effort that we need to put into controlling the situation. It's also useful to know where your weaknesses are. And lastly, know what your risks are. Do you have them written down? Do you have them documented? Can you prove with what you're doing that you're reducing the risks that you have in business? So excuse me for the, uh, the employees here. I'm going to use the bank, the central bank's strategic objectives. And they are what you would expect. <clears throat> we're looking at inflation. Uh, we're looking at regulation. We're looking at payment systems. We're looking at inclusivity in the financial sector. And a few other things as well. So all these things are important, as you can imagine. But look at this one here. Provide and promote a safe and efficient payment system. I think I can help here. To me, a safe payment system 
is an IT system that is secure, or as secure as we can get it. So yes, I think I can help and I can use this to help with my strategy. Let's move on. So it's also important to look outside of your organization as well as to what things affect you. Attacker will look for your weaknesses. And I describe this as an asymmetric war. It's a war because we are being attacked the whole time in cybersecurity. It's asymmetric because we have to keep all, all our controls, all our walls really high. The attacker is only looking for one weakness. One weakness is all it takes for an attacker to get in. That is why it's asymmetric. We have to do all the work, the attacker only has to find one weakness. So I hope you can see this photograph, this is more unclear. <clears throat> this is a security barrier to stop traffic coming in and going out of your, uh, of your establishment. I think I have evidence here that this is a weak control. I hope you would agree. So it's also important to know your enemy, to know who is attacking you, who is wanting to attack you. Who are they? What are they targeting? What are they looking for? Why are they doing that? How are they doing that? I think here is a good time to start managing some expectations. <clears throat> there is no such thing, in my opinion, as a totally secure system. I don't know if anybody knows of a control that is 100% effective. I certainly don't. And I think with, with this, what we have is a very important principle in security. It's called layers of defense. So not relying on one control, but relying on a number of controls, layers of defense that will protect you. Let me give you an example. Does anybody recognize this building? Anybody recognize it? Well, this is in London, which is why I recognize it. Maybe why you don't. This is the Tower of London. It's a very large castle in the center of London. And this is what it looked like about 600 years ago. And what do we have? we see a large ditch filled with water. So that is one layer of defense. We have high walls, another layer of defense. We even have internal walls as well, another layer of defense. How do you get in? There's a very limited number of places you can get in, limited entry points into the system. And when you get in, what happens? A guard stops you and checks your identity so he knows who you are. And then last of all, we have lots of watchtowers. These towers around the castle. They are monitoring. They are monitoring what happens so they can detect if anything bad is happening.
my example of layers of defense. But it's exactly the same in computer systems as well. And you don't want to rely on one layer. You put lots of layers in, give you more confidence. Many of you are familiar with this equation on the board. Risk equals frequency times impact. Have you seen this? I hope many of you have. Um, but to me, this is not very useful. This doesn't help me understand the risk. And it doesn't help me protect and reduce that risk. Risk also equals this. Risk is the, is the product of threats, vulnerabilities, and the value. So let's look at this. Let's look at our, um, <coughs> our example we have here of creating a safe payment system. And so let's look at threats first of all, this payment system. So, who may attack this payment system? Uh, corporations. Corporations often do industrial espionage. They spy on competitors looking for market secrets, trade secrets. They're unlikely to attack a, uh, a payment system. Um, hacktivists. People who promote their cause, they, they hack systems to promote a cause. Well, maybe they could. If they didn't agree with, with what your organization was doing. Nation states. So nation states do play a part here. They're looking to grow their power and their influence in the world. Uh, cyber terrorists. Um, luckily, we don't have um, <clears throat> too much terrorism at the moment, but that may change, and it may be certainly change in different regions of the world. Um, script kiddies is another people who can attack. These are people who can download tools to attack poorly configured systems. And then we've got some insiders, employees, and maybe people who are negligent and do something badly or make a, make a mistake. Maybe they could mess up a, a payment system without realizing it. What about a malicious insider? Maybe there are people who are very disgruntled, very unhappy with the place that they're working that they would try and disrupt the technology. Hmm, that's possible. And last one, cyber criminals. Hmm, their job's to make money. And we have a payment system. That's where the money is. Hmm, so maybe. So let's look, let's take a look at this, about how people may attack a payment system. Uh, where you could use malware to get an infection on your desktop PC. That may help. You could try and attack from the internet, so through your firewalls, onto your web-facing systems, your internet-facing systems. If you're talking about a payment system, it's probably an application that people use to put in the payment transaction details. That could be attacked. It's an hour of service. So quite often you have something called a distributed denial of service, where you have lots of people's PCs that are infected, and somebody can control all those PCs and fire traffic down at some of your servers. That might affect 
the availability of your systems. Your systems may go down because you can't handle all that traffic. You could have phishing emails, you could have people trying to trick you to do things, trick you to um, open an infected attachment in email, or maybe <coughs> convince you there's someone you're not, maybe the chief executive and he's asking for a payment to go somewhere. Um, there's also things like corrupt insiders. Can you bribe someone to give you access to systems? Uh, can you target the right people? And if you have a look at all those different types of people who could attack you, well, fraud and extortion is clearly at the top of our list when we're looking at protecting a payment system. But other people may want to attack you for different reasons. Um, a data breach or, or information leak, they may want to get um, critical information out of the organisation. Uh, they may want to, uh, I think that is intellectual property. So things like trade secrets uh, and sabotage, um, especially for activism and sabotage is, is one of the things that they like to do. So, we might come to some of these conclusions. For instance, We might consider that negligent insiders, employees, this is a low threat. Cyber terrorists slow, corporations slow, they probably won't attack the payment system. Ah, a malicious insider? Maybe. There's a medium threat level I put down. A nation state? Maybe. And it's important here to realise that threats change. So a nation state normally might not be that serious threat level. But if you're in a state of war with a country, or you have very bad relations with a country, maybe them attacking your payment system would be the, thing, would be the right thing for them to do. Bad thing for us. Um, script killings. We spoke about that earlier, saying they fairly simple download tools, Transact. That's really important. That means an attack if your if your IT controls are poor. Uh, activists as well. If you have ties in your business to unethical practices, that will become more important. Uh, but I would say that the highest threat level here are the cyber criminals. So here are three cases that we may be concerned about and want to protect. So the first one, we said that in a, in a payment system, you're likely to have an application sitting with your counterparts so they can enter the transaction on your But what happens if an attacker can access that application and hack that application to either port? Um, Frauds indirectly from there, or get connectivity to the lending bank systems. Or perhaps the attackers will target legitimate users in the business who have legitimate access to those systems. How could they do it? Well, one way is to is phishing, so you can send an email to them if you can find out who they are um, and have an infected attachment that you convince them to open up, infect the PC, and potentially the attacker can control that PC and then control what happens on that PC. We spoke about denial of service as well. 
So a <coughs> Uh, what has been done before and in the UK with online betting companies is that the, the criminal has threatened to take down your system through a denial of service attack unless they pay money. So an extortion is a, is a way that cyber criminals can fund themselves. So in our risk management equation, we have risk as the product of threats, vulnerabilities, and the value of the asset. So let's look at vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities is a weakness that can be exploited by an attacker. So in IT systems, maybe a lack of patching and updating of your technology and your infrastructure can cause vulnerabilities. Badly written applications can cause vulnerabilities, especially in case where, <coughs> that we were talking about earlier, if your application is being used out on the internet, then there's lots of people who can have access to that and can attempt to break into it. Weak passwords is a very simple vulnerability. But if, a, if an attacker can guess your password, or if he already knows one of your passwords, he may guess that you use the same password in other systems. But we shouldn't forget other business processes as well. Business processes can have weakness as well. Um, for instance, maybe the duties within that system aren't segregated enough. Maybe there's one person who can both input a payment transaction and can authorize a payment transaction. Now those, those duties should be separate, within separate to separate people, but sometimes they're not. And people. People, unfortunately, you, me, us all, are often the weak link in security. This is why security is, is everybody's job. Uh, and probably a good reason why we depend so much on technology-based controls, so people aren't in the way. But do you remember this building? Yes, we do remember it. Okay. Uh, do you know what is tech there? Do you know what is tech? It's the British Crown Jewels that kept in that building. <clears throat> so these Crown Jewels, if you remember, are protected by that ditch full of water, the high walls, more walls inside, limited entry points. What else was there? Watchtowers monitoring it, identity checks. Um, so these are totally safe, right? With all of those layers of control, they say? Well, 500 years ago, they were guarded by somebody who wanted a little bit of that extra money. So he arranged to charge people an entry fee to come and have a look at those round rules. Unfortunately, he let these three gentlemen in gladly took their money. Unfortunately, people know their head, took the crown jewels with them. And the crown you see there, the crown on the head, <coughs> they couldn't hide it. No, it was the crown. You couldn't put the crown on your head. They put it on the floor, stamped on it, put it flat, and then they could hide it, and they tried to walk out of it. Luckily, all these layers of defense, one of those layers caught them on the way out, so they didn't get out. But they did get the crown jewels. <clears throat> so yes, people are often the weak link in security. 
The last part of that equation we had for risk was value. Sometimes we want to protect everything in the same way. So for instance, anti-malware software or anti-virus software on your PC. You want to put that on every PC in your organization. It's simple to do, it's quite cheap. However, if it wasn't cheap, would you do that? So here's an, <coughs> another example here. This is um, two-factor authentication. Um, has a translator translated two-factor authentication? Is that okay? It's where you have <coughs> not only something you know, like your password, uh, but something you have. So that might be like a token uh, that comes on an SMS text message, or on a little fob, or it could even be something you know, like your fingerprint. But would you want to put that on everybody in your organization? Yes, it would be safer. You would know exactly who people were. There could be no sharing of passwords. But it's not a cost-effective way of doing security. That's quite expensive if you want to do um, thin technology anywhere. Or have a fob with um, a one-time password. That's all quite expensive. So maybe you would only do that on accounts that have a lot of privileges. Accounts that can um, uh, potentially do a lot of damage, but are used in order to uh, maintain the IT infrastructure. Or it could be the business as well. So important business functions may have two factor authentication on them as well. But it's really important that when you're putting a strategy together, you know what's important to your business. You know what is valuable and what you're trying to protect the most. Now for us, it's easy. We've already identified it. This is our valuable system. The payment system is what we're, we're trying to protect in this example. When you're looking to protect the system, you want to make sure that you're looking at all possible ways of protecting it and not limiting yourself too much. And I would recommend that you use some framework to help you cover all aspects of cybersecurity. This is ISO 27001 the international standard for information security. These are all the areas. And you may say some of those areas, they don't seem very important. It's human resources important for our payment system. What about physical security? Well, the same is all online. Do we, do we need to know about physical security? Let's look at some of these controls and see. So human resources is important, for instance, it's important for them to vet people before they join the organisation, to make sure that they have no criminal background. Access control, another area, oh, we've spoken about two-factor authentication, that would be very useful on a, on a payment system. You want to know exactly who it is that is using it and who is input transaction, Resort finance transactions. Uh, segregation of duties. We mentioned that earlier. You want to have different people doing different functions so fraud can't take place. Cryptography. Cryptography is a big subject and I won't try and explain it here. Um, but you can do things like prove that someone has sent you a message or sent a transaction to something called non-repudiation. Um, you might not think physical access is important to your system, but how easy is it for someone to tailgate somebody into a building? 
to follow them in directly behind so you don't have to show your access parts. Getting physical access to a system is, is one of the easiest ways that you can drill. Um, when you're developing a system, you should make sure that it's tested. Are the applications being properly tested for security? On the operations side, yes, we have lots of things. We have patching we need to do. We need to make sure our systems have got the latest patches on so they are not so vulnerable to attack. Um, suppliers, maybe we're buying this system from somewhere, from a third company, from a third party company. How well do you know that company? Can you be sure that one of the developers of that system doesn't allow a back door into it where he can go and enter transactions fraudulently? Are you sure of that company's information security controls? So do due diligence on your suppliers, another important control. And then on availability, yeah, IT, IT servers do sometimes go down. It's important we have redundancy, i.e. two sets of systems, so if one goes down, we can still carry on. And if there is a big disaster, a fire, an explosion, a flood, like today, the London weather, um, <coughs> it's important that we can recover from these disasters quickly and efficiently and not disrupt the systems too much. When you're looking at strategy, it's important that you're not looking at just one system. You need to consider the whole of the environment, the whole of the technology environment, the whole of the environment that's looking after your data, that's looking after your information security assets. So lots of things to think of. One of the most important, you must know what you have. Because if you don't know what you have, you can't manage it. You can't manage something you don't know about. And you can't implement security controls on something you don't know about. You need to know where you're weak. So you need to be continuously looking out to see where you have vulnerabilities in your environment. And then when you find those vulnerabilities, that you're communicating to the people to get them fixed in good time. Um, <clears throat> these privileges. So, it's, <clears throat> it's very important that people don't have too much privilege into a system. If somebody doesn't need access to that payment system, they should not have access to that payment system. Securing IT from the start. So when you implement new servers, new services, new devices, make sure they're secure when you put them in. And don't think, well, I'll put it in now, sometime later I'll come back and secure it. Well, it doesn't happen, or it's too late. Identify and manage incidents. Um, are you monitoring what's happening on your payment system? Do you understand if there is someone trying to attack it? If there is some traffic that's looking strange, is that a hacker trying to attack it? It's important that you are capturing all, the, all these security events and you're looking to see whether that is a real incident or not. Can you correlate lots of similar actions? Maybe you're being attacked. What else have they got here? Protecting the end user. We've spoken about that, and secure your boundary. Uh, this is mostly around your network. You want to make sure that bad people can't get into your firewalls. Um, but it's also a little bit more than that. You've got a payment system here. Just somebody who doesn't work in, that, <coughs> in the payments area, or an IT person, 
who doesn't administer that the payment system service? Do they need access? I don't think so. So maybe one of the things you could consider is protecting with your network the border around your payment system and the payment system service. <clears throat> so, I think we've got all the information here, so we can start assembling our strategy. I think it's important that you're creating a story here, that you're able to tell your management, your team, your peers, what your strategy is. It's not a bullet list. It's about protecting your organization. It's about responding to the business objectives that we have. You want to know what controls you want to implement? Uh, what are the most important ones? And what protection do they give them? And again, we probably need to manage expectations. This isn't going to solve all your problems but it's going to help an awful lot. Get feedback on it. People, other people will have really good thoughts about what you can do and how you can do it. And socialise your strategy. Make sure people, everyone, knows what you're doing and why you're doing it and why it's important. And lastly, let's look a little bit into the future. It's, it's important that your strategy is not stationary. It's important that your strategy evolves as things change. Maybe you've got new vendors, new suppliers, new technology that all needs to be protected. Maybe you start using technology services in the cloud or using applications in the cloud. We have mobile systems now, uh, maybe even cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin or the likes will be important for your organization. Maybe there's changes to the business strategy that you have. Uh, maybe you're merging with another com company or buying another company. How does that change your strategy? It should change. And of course, there are new vulnerabilities, new threats, and the people attacking us, unfortunately, are getting cleverer and cleverer and more sensitive. Okay, what's your strategy? Thank you very much. Yes, from the design point. 
security should be designed into products. And don't try and attempt, once you've got a product, to drop security on top. And that's the unfortunate that doesn't become a situation to put security after. Yeah, that's wrong way around. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for being here. Very nice to talk. My name is Al Hunter. I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard University. Um, my question was more related to uh, when you talked about identifying attackers that would be interested in your business. This type of business intelligence, how would you go about obtaining this? Do you foresee more of a, an alliance with a private company, uh, perhaps having an in-house team that would be constantly researching this landscape, or perhaps alliances with academia, which in my case, I would be biased and the latter. Yeah. I would say yes to all those, but it depends on your organization what makes sense. There are some very good security services out there that will do it for you. Um, I would also say there's a fourth one as well, which is collaboration between your peers. So similar organizations, so organizations in financial services, to pool their knowledge about uh, cyber attacks and our enemies. Yes. Thank you very much. One the back. How do you have information about the uh, number, maybe percentage of cases of fraud committed through or using social engineering instead of more sophisticated tools? Maybe in the UK or the European Union. Um, nearly, nearly all the attacks have some kind of social engineering with it. I would say that phishing is a kind of social engineering. To make your phishing email very believable, you need to know somebody about who you're sending it to. So they may, <coughs> so the attacker may go to Facebook to do reconnaissance or LinkedIn. Uh, you may call up your help desk and you may come and visit the building and try and find out uh, who reports to who. Um, sometimes that is, there's information in the public domain that people can use. I would say nearly all attacks have some part of social engineering. Um, but the ones that I've been interested in, small part of social engineering, large part of, uh, of technology. I don't know, Thomas, do you have uh, other... Um, So whenever we, uh, when we did the security testing of backing system, whenever we burned good old social engineering way, like tailgating, talking ourselves into the premises of the bank. Once you're in the premise of the bank and there is an unprotected network connection, that bank is a potential from a security point of view. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. It's so big numbers. Um, I'm really grateful. And uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, for, for having us here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, cybersecurity and the relationship between cybersecurity, financial institutions, and banks, or generally the, um, uh, the financial system, a regulation of, of those uh, institutions. A couple of words about uh, my background. I, uh, I started uh, my career in information security almost 25 uh, years ago. 
First of all, I did, I designed uh, systems for that, electronic and internet and uh, systems. And then later I was asked to break those systems as, as an ethical hacker. And, uh, and it turned out that I made, as a designer, a huge stupid mistake. So, big lesson learned. When, when you switch your hats from designing to attacking and then back to designing, you can really learn. So, uh, that's how I started. And then, uh, for some reason, I, I had uh, quite uh, like three or four uh, central bank clients as, as a penetration tester. And um, there's an interesting story that brings back to, uh, to Philip's uh, story. Uh, once we are inside of an institution, as as uh, ethical hackers, that institution probably will, uh, will fail the security matter. So uh, it's very important to protect the boundary. So we did this internet, inter internal penetration test, and we were caught in the, part, in the first two hours of it. And that never happened before, and never happened after in my career. So that was the only case in one central bank that they caught us like that. I get back later what is the link and how. So let me let me turn to the uh, topics I, I'm uh, uh, trying to address today. Let me try first um, bust a couple of myths about uh, information security or cyber security. There are a couple of things that are so persistently believed that uh, it is really strange, while in fact they are not necessarily true. Then. I can show you the uh, flat landscape as it relates to the financial sector, as we see from, from the IMF. We've got uh, connections uh, to, to many, many uh, authorities around the world. Um, usually when we do a, a conference in D.C., then probably 67 jurisdictions will do that time. So we have a, a great number of uh, people to, to see what's going on. And then finally, I will touch upon the cybersecurity supervision. So if you're an institution, then what can you expect? Where is the world going in terms of uh, cybersecurity regulation and supervision? Um, some of this might be not very good news because you need to up your game. But generally speaking, uh, supervisory and regulatory efforts are growing. And that means that uh, the uh, requirements are getting higher in terms of uh, compliance. So, first thing, cyber is an IT issue. And I, I hear this almost every, every time I discuss this topic with a financial institution. And then usually people expect the IT department or the IT security information security department to solve every problem. While in fact it's not. Cyber is cyber. People, process, and technology as well. And, and people and process part of it is as, as important as the technology part of it. And as you heard before, uh, people are quite many times with weakest link and through social engineering attacks, we can get into very well protected systems. Even if the technology doesn't fail, if, if the human element fails, then, then it can get in. Or the other way around. If the technology is not so strong, but people are vigilant, they have cyber security awareness, they know what to do, and it's so much difficult to get it. So, that's a myth. Cyber risk is not an IT issue. So if your board wants to uh, deal with cyber security risks through the IT department, it's not just them. It's even the HR department. Another one, and that's called the security through obscurity fallacy. Like, uh, the world is so big, there are so many big targets out there. Why me? Why would anyone attack me personally? Why? I'm a nobody. I'm just a small uh, employee at a small bank somewhere in a not too big country. So why? Now, the reason why is because most of the attacks are automatic. So there is no effort in finding you. We did this experiment, we built a, um, an unprotected system and we put out on the internet unprotected. It lasts less like than half an hour. You can try it for yourself. Uh, half an hour later, somebody is in. That's not why. It's not like people are always looking for those boxes. There are programs that are looking for those unprotected boxes. And the whole thing is automated. And there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of voting machines 
that I collected in my botnet, so called botnet, who could look out of these things. So the problem is that the automation of the attack and the connaissance is, is at such a high level that we can't find. So just because you are in a small country, small bank, small employee, doesn't mean that you don't get hacked. And then with your access, the whole institution could be compromised. That's the problem. Third one, cyber has come from the outside. So we protect everything. The perimeter is very strong, we have two walls, very strong uh, defense. And that's fine, but uh, as you can see, one third of the attacks initiate, are initiated by insiders. So the insider threat is, is, is quite, uh, quite important. So we need to deal with that. 28% of incidents are attributed to insiders. And then cyber risk uh, management is very technical. It's esoteric. It's, it's like you really have to be super duper proficient in all IT technologies. It's not the case. Actually, and it's not me, it's uh, one prominent person from the Bank of England who told in the front of the large IMF audience that he believes, and that's his experience, that, that approximately 90% of the work in Bank of England does in terms of uh, of uh, regulation, supervision, and uh, on-site inspection, whatever, this is not very technical in, in cyber security. And this is uh, where I uh, get back to my first example. Um, we were sitting in that um, central bank, successfully hacked into a system, and very, very, in like less than uh, two hours, internal security guards came in and they just took us away and said that now it is the police. So we were quite afraid of the situation. But we had an auto check letter. So I had a letter from the CEO of the bank. I'm authorized to do the hacking, so we were, we were released. And then, of course, we analyzed the situation. And then, um, how could it happen? And it happens that, um, that an accountant called us. The accountants are not uh, hackers. And they, don't, they don't do usually deep IT stuff, right? But then, this accountant walked into her office and what she saw, what she saw is that there was something strange going on at the computer nearby, it was a screen saver and nobody was touching that computer. And she thought, this is funny, that's for security. And the reason why that screen saver on that machine went away is because at the exact same time, we just took it over. So if the internal security gets the call, immediately identifies the machine, sees that it's compromised, they then look at the traffic, realize that somebody from another room is, uh, is communicating that machine, call the security guard, and there you go, we are caught. And it didn't involve the, the detection of, of the incident, it didn't involve any technical capability whatsoever. If at that central bank, the uh, user awareness program were as efficient or effective, then we would have had that central bank as a couple of others to do. So it was the human element that, uh, that caught us, and it's a very big lesson. Uh, oftentimes you have high-end technologies, and user awareness is not up to the smart, and then it means that, uh, that you're still quite, uh, quite vulnerable. So it's a very, very, very uh, big lesson we learned at that time. Let me turn to the, um, to the flat landscape. So what do we see is outside and what are those trends that we need to pay attention, especially in the future, in the near future, in the midterm. Now, I, um, I wouldn't like to spend too much time on, uh, on all sorts of, uh, of scary news. You probably can gather those news. Every year there is a big hack. Uh, Equifax lost 150 million American citizens' data. Um, this Central bank was hacked, 80 million dollars was stolen. Even in, uh, in Latin America, there was a bank hack last year, and 10 million dollars was stolen. So there are all stories that are The importance is that the trend intensifies. So it's more and more of this. And more and more of this from uh, the financial sector, which is uh, worrying. On the other hand, it's understandable because we see that cyber criminals, uh, cyber criminal activity is is, uh, is increasing and that's, that's the uh, interest in those two. And one other thing that I think is specifically relevant for you 
is that uh, this type of attacks recently have shifted towards Latin America and Southeast Asia. So that's where we see a, an increase in, uh, in attacks. Uh, both dial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks and both uh, attacks uh, against uh, payment interfaces or even payment systems start trying to, uh, to do fraudulent transactions. Now, the reason of that is probably because the, um, the uh, advanced economy is really uh, got stronger uh, cyber security control over their financial systems in recent, uh, in recent uh, maybe two years approximately. So uh, always the attackers go after the leader. So in this case, unfortunately, Latin American countries and Southeast Asian countries are who are really behind, and that's why they see uh, more attacks. But that's why we are involved, actually, exactly these regions for this reason, because we see that there's the uh, increased activity. And unfortunately, this is a contagion attack. Once somebody is hacked, uh, even in a small country somewhere in Asia, then uh, the, at least the reputational uh, damage for the uh, international payment system can be pretty bad. And then, all of a sudden, even uh, the advanced economies feel the impact. Actually, this has happened a few years back with the uh, famous number of central bank, if you thought if you of that. So yes, increasing the uh, effects of the finance sector and it's going to, to increase in the future. Um, Philip covered uh, who are those attackers generally, so I'm not going to go into details on this slide. I will just point out the nation states and proxy organizations as something that's increasing. And that is really very worrying because we don't have uh, rules of engagement in cyberspace. And the attribution problem is very difficult. So once nation states get into the game, they can hide and it's very difficult to, to attribute the attack. And only the real, very big agencies in the world can do that. Um, maybe three agencies or four agencies can say with certainty that yes, this was from this country or that was from that country. For example, back then, I'm originally from Hungary and I used to run the uh, um, IT um, supervision division at the Central Bank of Hungary and once we had a huge attack coming from South Korea. Like, why? Why do these South Koreans have anything with us? It turns out they have nothing, they have nothing with us. Uh, South Korea was a good uh, staging area because they had huge uh, numbers of uh, uh, fast PCs that were always on and they had very high bandwidth connection to the internet. So once somebody had the, like hundreds, thousands of uh, Korean, South Korean uh, PCs, then they used that as a bridge head to attack us. Obviously, the attacker were in South Korea and all they just used those machines. But then we were able to determine where that came from. Some other agencies, like in the United States, they did tell exactly like this. This is from another country. But that's outside of our capabilities, really. So, nation states and proxy organizations are getting the heavy prominence, unfortunately. And uh, more things. Why do people do this? Um, First, let me touch on uh, external versus internal. You see that, uh, that uh, roughly it's, uh, it's just uh, ondulating around uh, uh, one third internal, two thirds external. And the reason for attacks is, uh, is mostly financial. And there's an interesting uh, uh, complementarity. So when the espionage went up, then the financial of it went down. Which one reason probably is that some actors do the do the same sometimes they for external reasons, sometimes for financial reasons. So why they're busy spying their cannot still as much money. Something like that. But this is all uns uns uh, not scientific, it's just our, our gut feeling. And based on discussion we had with uh, several uh, intelligence uh, organizations. And then again if we uh, put together the um, unaffiliated actors, the state affiliated actors, and the uh, nation states, which are explicitly uh, nation state actors, we see that's a big chunk. And it is growing, that's the issue. Yeah? It's growing and, um, well, some countries have tiny armies, which are really to protect the members. Another interesting trend is, uh, is the very sharp rise of uh, ransomware. You're all familiar with them, you probably heard the news about uh, various uh, 
incident with the involving events on time, and you have to pay to, to, um, to get your complete, complete unlock. But why? Why it took up, took up in 2015? That's very interesting. From, from 2015 on, it just increased in multiple times. And why is that? Well, the link is with the uh, cryptocurrency. So that was when the cryptocurrency took off. And they were really became quite popular starting from 2014. And you had so many variants of uh, cryptocurrency. So it was much easier to uh, demand ransom in a cryptocurrency. But ransomware existed like for 20 years ago. But at that time, it was quite safe to write ransomware because you demanded money and then uh, you had to receive that money to a bank, uh, um, a bank transfer, for example. And then it was obvious to do it. Or almost obvious to do it. With, with uh, the anonymity of the uh, virtual currencies, this is much easier now. So that's why we see this, uh, there's a connection between uh, the rise of cryptocurrencies and, uh, and the rise of uh, ransomware. And oftentimes, uh, ransomware attacks, not oftentimes, but more and more ransomware attacks are used as camouflage, which happened exactly last year in a, in a not too far away country. Yeah, very big bank was, was attacked, and it took like a ransomware attack. But in fact, what they did, they went after the, uh, the uh, payment system. And uh, that was just uh, smoke and mirrors so to detract the advance. Again, uh, state actors and ATP, so called advanced assistant threats, latest risk from Symantec. Um, it's not very easy to see, but the first column in the red box is credential set, and then active directory enumeration. Active directory. Enumeration, that's a difficult word in English. So, so whenever we see those two as, as yes at, at, a, at a group, then we know that they are quite sophisticated. These, these are the things that they really are after, and those are the then so called the dangerous times. Because these two are, are uh, maybe the signature, the modus operandi, not the modus operandi, the, uh, the, the main goals they are after. So, uh, bottom line is that. Uh, uh, as a advanced person, that's nation states, uh, cross organizations, uh, activities, is rising and uh, creates a lot of difficulty. And now this is almost science fiction. We've got attacks powered by artificial intelligence. Why? Because the fans also started to use artificial intelligence. So they recognize patterns, uh, animals in traffic, and they will uh, dynamically, dynamically adapt the defense system. With these very, uh, very advanced uh, defense mechanism. So why shouldn't attackers also use artificial intelligence? And one really worrying thing is, is the defect. So I can't be see people here. Yeah. What do you think is common in them? Not one of them is real. This is CGI. So these people don't have this. It, they were created, those spaces were created by computers. The implication? You can create lots and lots of profiles online and use them as a proxy to get into. Or use it into malicious uh, chatbots or, or uh, in the financial sector uh, like fake uh, robo-advisors. So it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous. Again, this, this is probably the future, so it's not here now. But uh, at the um, proof of concept level, it's, it's, it's working. Another worrying thing is that there is a huge gap between, uh, uh, between attackers and defenders when it comes to how fast they are. So if you see the attackers are there, the uh, compromise and exfiltration takes place, uh, takes place in minutes. So uh, if, if they are really quick, then they compromise the system, steal the data, and they're out. Or do the transaction, and they're out. And that takes minutes, really. Now, the discovery and the containment takes months. So I mean, I, I hack the system, I steal the money, I'm out. And then, of course, the, the missing money will be discovered very quickly. But then, finding out what actually happened and who was that guys can take months. And then, indeed, this is what happened uh, several cases that uh, we've seen up very uh, closely in recent times. Now, there is still a silver lining in here, meaning that, uh, that at least the, uh, 
the average or median days after the discovery is decreasing quite nicely. So as you see in 2011, 2011, it took more than a year to figure this out. Who attacked us? What did they do? do and and uh, what was the most of uh, This is uh, steadily decreasing. So now we only have around three months' time. But still, this is very wrong compared to the, the swift attack and um, I mean, very fast attack and exploitation that we can see from the uh, cyber criminals. Yes, I got an interesting uh, uh, document called the uh, ITU, the Inter International Therapeutic Union's uh, Cyber Security Index, and that has a whole section on, on Latin America. And Latin America's preparedness in terms of uh, cyber security. And um, it's not it's from 2017, of course, but it still has relevance. And uh, the more interesting thing for me is that uh, there's another independent source, the uh, IDB report on cyber security, and there is correlation between those two, which means that more or less they, they show a realistic picture, not necessarily true to the last uh, bit, but still. And this is how it looks like. I don't need to. Uh, First, it's very difficult to read the common names or apologies for that. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, it's pretty rare. There are so many red dots. But the comments are different, uh, different uh, uh, factors how cyber security preparedness is measured, like legislative, uh, regulatory, technical, user awareness, and so forth and so forth. I would suggest that you Google uh, this IT cyber security index and then you can see exactly where uh, you stay. Paraguay is, is, I would say, in the middle of the pack in Latin America. Overall, it's yellow, and then we've got many more reds and a uh, few green. So, yes, um, there's so much to do. I hope uh, this, this index will be repeated soon so we can see some improvement. I can tell already that for some countries it's, it's a little bit better because we were already involved, for example, in uh, international outreach and we have a couple of uh, countries here. So, for example, on, on the international uh, engagement column, they turn into green, so that's nice. So, there is a lot of work that's in the bottom line here. Okay, so um, first I talked about, uh, about uh, cyber security myths and how we, we uh, see that they are not really true. Then about the um, um, status of cyber security or the cyber attack landscape. Let me now turn to the supervision. So what about uh, regulating and supervising the financial sector in terms of cyber risk? And uh, the first thing we need to understand is why is this such a big interest for central banks and for authorities in general? Central banks we all know they are invest, they are their main role, or one of the main roles is to protect the financial system stability. And traditionally these are via the monetary policy and other macro uh, types of measures. But then recently cyber risk has grown to the level that we believe it can impact not just the country's financial system, but global financial system. To think of a successful attack against SWIFT, the payment system, the international payment system. If somebody managed to hack SWIFT, nobody will trust that anymore. So how would you do international payment now? It's, I don't even want to think about that scenario, but it would be a disaster. So that's why IMF and other World Bank and the central banks all around the world are very worried about uh, the financial stability impact of cyber risk. Now, we didn't see a so-called uh, black swan event, meaning the real bad disaster scenario. It just didn't happen yet. But really, it's not very difficult to put together such a scenario. And then, as you see, the trend is increasing, and it's more and more likely that something can happen. So that's why central banks are very interested in, in cyber security regulation and supervision, and that's why you, me, you can expect, uh, uh, well, increased regulation and increased uh, uh, compliance checking on cyber security. Um, transmission channels mean those things that, uh, that transmit the cyber events uh, uh, effects to the financial system. We are now about to publish a paper about this, 
it will be optimized amongst time, and we'll discuss it much more detail. But in essence, we think about three channels, three, three transmission channels, how cyber risk affects uh, financial stability. The first is loss of confidence, which is very easy, just like I mentioned too. That's an exact example of uh, loss of confidence. The second is really lack of substitute Very difficult for us, sorry. Substitutability. Substitutability. Which means that both systems that we use in the financial sector are not so easy to switch out. So if one becomes unavailable, then what else in its place? Not, not much. Many countries, or not many countries, almost every country has exactly one real time across settlement payment system, RTGS system. Now, interestingly enough, another country nearby has two. But that's, that's not the norm, that's an uh, that's, uh, exception. So, if I can't substitute something easily and it goes down, then I have a shock to the financial system and, and then I uh, have very serious problems. And third, the interconnections between firms, both of the, on, the, uh, on the technological plane, just think about vendors that serve many clients and their concentrations of risk there, but also on the financial plane, meaning that, that they are interconnected at the level of the business they do together. So one, one has a problem because of the cyber risk, then it's a liquidity issue, they just cannot pay their, their bills or, or their, their dues, what they have to pay. And then it's a cascade effect. And several models show that it can go pretty bad. And that's what we did. So we have this paper is published already. Um, we did a, um, a quantitative model modeling of, of the cyber risk effect on the financial sector globally. Um, and the worst case scenario, which is represented by the last column there, is that almost 50% of the bank's uh, profits can be wiped out in a, in a big systemic black swan type of event, meaning that it's, it's a real, real global type of cyber attack. But again, even the historical experience, so if we don't extrapolate, we just take a look at what happened already, we see that uh, around 9% of bank profits are affected by, by cyber risk, which is pretty bad, I would say. Okay, and another example why uh, my regulators uh, really want to, to address more cyber risk. This is a, a survey we did last December, so it's quite fresh. And uh, I'm only allowed to show you two slides, okay, because the others are, I don't know if for central banks. But these we can go public with. So this is uh, regulation versus threat level as perceived by, by the central bank themselves. We asked, um, I think, six. Uh, 58 central banks and 40 they, they responded. So it's a pretty, pretty good uh, representative uh, sample. The, um, the bottom line is that the perception is that compared to the threat level, the regulation it really is lagging behind. So it, it's not just a feeling, it's a feedback of, of, uh, of our peers at, at central banks that we feel that our efforts to, to try to regulate and, uh, and come up with a good uh, Good solution is, uh, is lagging. The other one, which are the most important uh, worries of, of central banks or other regulatory authorities uh, in terms of cyber risk management, um, as it relates to their own, uh, own uh, supervised institutions. It turns out that first is the ability to recover from a successful cyber attack. Now, what does that tell you? I used to be a central bank person and a supervisory person myself, and I had the same, same fear. What does that tell you? It tells you that you assume already that you're going to be hacked. Because you're not worried that you're going to be hacked, you will be hacked. You are worried that you can't get back from being hacked, so usually. So that's an interesting shift, because just seven, eight years ago this was not in the way. The way of thinking about if you protect boundary and nobody will get in, and that's our main goal to make sure that nobody gets in. Now it's different. Now we think that uh, eventually banks or other financial institutions uh, will, will be hacked. And what we need to focus on is to detect it very fast and recover very fast. So this is the assumed breach uh, philosophy in, in, in supervisory uh, efforts. Second is response to cyber attacks. 
So what do we do first? I'm a vet. What's next? I'm just sitting there and thinking, well, I really know what to do. And only the third is the protection of that side. So we are quite okay if we think that most institutions there are a certain reasonable level of protection, and that's only the third concern of the, of the regulators. Quite interesting. And, and if you're from financial institutions, it's interesting to keep in mind that regulators already think that uh, people are going to get into the system. And then there's a dilemma as, as regulators. I, uh, I led a team who did some regulation, which was quite groundbreaking at the time. For example, we did one of the first uh, cloud security regulations in Europe. It's always this dilemma between being uh, principle based and prescriptive. So being a more relaxed, more broad, regular, more broad uh, rules or, or very strict rules. Because if you do the first with the principle based, then that's relatively simple because you only need to, to focus on, on principles like, like broadly uh, uh, formulated statements. And then it would be probably uh, valid for more time. If you are go into the detail level, complex, rules imply more detail and are difficult to maintain. That's, that's the uh, experience with that. But then it's interesting the uh, correlation between the level of uh, the sense of the market development and which, which regulation is, is best suited. It turns out that, uh, that more prescriptive rules are better suited for emerging markets, for example. It's, it's a long story why I'm not going to go into that, but it's, a, it's an interesting conclusion here. Yeah. And then we don't, we don't really need to go into this dilemma because we can do principles, broad principles, we can do outcome focus for, for rules and baselines, and those three together will provide a, a very good uh, regulatory framework. And let me give you an example. But first, a little talk about principles. There's an interesting uh, document called the G7. Uh, fundamental elements of cyber security, the G7 being the, uh, the most advanced seven economies. And they put together this, these principles. Again, I would just suggest to, to take a look at it. This is our own view on it, because they don't, don't use this picture, which is very difficult to see here. There's a feedback loop. So we start with the risk and mental assessment, then we go to monitoring, response, recovery, and then there is a feedback with continuous learning. If the famous PDCA cycle, some of you are probably familiar with if you are into uh, cyber security. And uh, the nice thing about it is that it is maybe a five, six pages document and it is very easy to understand. So that's why we use this as a starting point whenever we do cyber security uh, regulation, uh, technical assistance, for example, for, for various uh, central banks. Then the uh, outcome focus rules. That's, um, that's pretty simple to uh, at least conceptual. We would like to describe the desired end state. So we don't bother with, with telling what to do. We would like to tell where you should be. So the what, sorry, the what instead of how. So we describe the uh, I completely so we describe the, the end state and then how we get there is is really your choice. A couple of examples. Now this is, uh, this can be uh, uh, a little bit confusing, but let's pick, uh, let's pick the last, because that's easy. Data must be classified according to defined confidential requirements. So that's the rule. The central bank says that, and we need to, to comply. But note that they don't say anything about how many categories there should be, what data sh should go into the classification scheme at all, or, or uh, who should do it, nothing. You should just have something like this. You have to define the confidential requirements and then you have to, to classify your own data. And that's it. And that gives a lot of flexibility. And this will withstand, I don't know, 20 years in a rule like this. So this is the way we think about uh, regulating cybersecurity uh, in the uh, financial sector. And actually promote this type of uh, more flexible regulation that abstracts from the uh, technical uh, details. Because technical details will change almost every And And baselines, baselines are the documents that describe the minimum security levels required. So no matter who you are in the financial sector, a small uh, security firm or the largest bank, the standard bank in the country, you still need to comply with a baseline. And that's again 
I remember cyber hygiene I mentioned once. It's, a, it's about making sure that everybody at least has a minimum level of immunity against the virus. So the financial system as a whole has, has, has a baseline. That's how it, how it works. And then, finally, um, let me show you a couple of recommend, typical recommendations we make for, for authorities that regulate and, and supervise the uh, financial sector. Just for you to be prepared and when you talk to your own regulator, the supervisor, and then you'll see these things that, that there is some convergence uh, between, between authorities. So, um, first step, supervisors, regulators should identify the threat landscape in their own country. So what is the risk profile in Paraguay? You need to understand that as a regulator supervisor. That map the financial and the cyber networks. It doesn't need to be an exact map like a Google map, but at least a mental image of what's in the system, what are the main risk concentrations, what systems are involved, what vendors are involved, uh, what, what main uh, core banking systems are used, and so forth and so forth. Now most of this is already done, of course. There's no question about it. But some of them are not. Then uh, tailored and coherent cybersecurity regulation. What we see often that is that these regulations are just boilerplate, so copy based on somewhere else and not necessarily tied to the uh, actual situation in the country. Strengthen the supervisory assessment process. What does it mean? It simply means when, uh, when supervisors uh, do their work, they should do something uh, like uh, in that on-site examinations, more of that. Of course, that requires more resource, and that's a difficult question. Also, it is uh, very difficult that uh, these, uh, uh, these examinations are compliance-based, so checking documents and making sure that that is, that is, that is, that. That's not very effective, so that's why we suggest that uh, it should go into the control effectiveness testing, actually making sure that those controls work. Sampling and, and then see how it works. And clarifying regulatory reporting requirements. Oftentimes, the situation is, it is a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. An institution cannot be sure whether now they need to report something or not. And that clarification is very helpful. Work with the industry, meaning that there should be a constructive discussion between the regulator, supervisor, and the industry on what is possible at all, what makes sense, and on the other hand, what must be done. Like, Regulators also have some, some lines that they wouldn't cross, no matter what. So they wouldn't allow it to lack cyber security at all. Seek feedback and encourage information sharing. And about information sharing, uh, there was an interesting experience we had. Um, there are several mechanisms that uh, help information sharing on cyber security. One, maybe the best, is FSI set. It's a US-based system and financial institutions can be all part of it and then share information about the tax, about uh, what is of and all that. And whenever a central bank gets in, then people just shut up. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's interesting, right? Because it, it is felt like, uh, well, if the, if the central bank is, is within this circle, then, then uh, next time I'm going to have a happy time because I, I mentioned something that I shouldn't have. So the suggestion is that the central banks don't necessarily need to be involved in, in, in the information sharing of the industry, but they, they can encourage the process and help the process. That's exactly what the, the, the central banks do. And with that, I think that it's time to, to sum it up. So everybody's a target, remember, just because you're small and uh, you think that you work in a small institution doesn't mean that you wouldn't be found by an automatic attack. That's, that's almost certain. The cyber attacks against the financial industry is just getting better and better and then more and more, you see them, especially against uh, payment systems, payment system interfaces, co-banking system, payment system modules, obviously because that's where the money is. Uh, large banking system incident, systemic incident could be about like 50% of the bank's profits, which is huge, and that's why central banks are interested because of the macro uh, economic, macro financial uh, implications and financial stability. Um, the cyber security regulation supervision is getting stronger, so it's something to prepare for. It will be more costly, it will be more uh, time consuming, and it will be more resources to do it. 
But again, it's something that's needed. Think about the airline industry. The airline industry got so secure because it is so very rich. Similarly, the financial sector has to be evaluated from cyber security because, because uh, that's, that's the way to, to get stronger. It's, it's, a, it's a long story, by the way, why regulation is needed in today's world of uh, cyber security. And the main reason is that our physical world and our digital world superimpose. So, 20 years ago, a computer was just a computer. Now a computer has four wheels and an engine and it's called an electric car. And you have the computer in an electric car and you have crashes. And same with the financial system. So, bottom line, regulation is going to be uh, probably stronger and uh, compliance uh, uh, more difficult to achieve, but something, it's something that, that we all need to. And with that, uh, well, thank you very much for your attention and then we'll come for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Very good question because the topic is difficult. Um, what I was referring to was the role of the central bank. So the central bank and the generally deregulate uh, doing this. Now, how they go about it, there are a couple of ways. Uh, I can give you actual examples that work. So one of these examples is to have uh, living relationships with all the chief information securities of major banks and having their feedback all. The other one is, is to study the, uh, you set up a good regulatory reporting regime and then have maybe years worth of, uh, of incident data. And then you can figure out what's going on, like see the plan in it. And third, you can buy any services. Um, so these things. It's very similar to what uh, Philip mentioned in your question. It's, it's quite almost the same thing. Um, and in my experience, as coming from a small jurisdiction like uh, Hungary, is, is, we have 10 million people, like 7 10 million people. You go up, you go up Paraguay has 7 million. Uh, the uh, interpersonal relationships within the cyber security community in the financial sector is very important. And we disrespect to Well, again, thank you so much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Tomás, por esta interesante charla. También, Filipe, muchas gracias. ¿Qué hemos visto esta tarde entonces con estas dos exposiciones de estos profesionales del Fondo Monetario? En primer lugar, hemos analizado la importancia de que las estrategias de ciberseguridad de las organizaciones se encuentren alineadas a las estrategias de la organización. Hemos visto la manera de hacerlo. Seguramente recordamos la fórmula que mencionó Kirin al principio. Hablo de vulnerabilidades por amenazas, por activos. De esta manera, si identificamos adecuadamente dentro de nuestra organización estos aspectos, definitivamente vamos a ser capaces de diseñar estrategias que sean de valor para nuestra organización y vamos a poder construir mecanismos de seguridad que se alineen con los objetivos de nuestras compañías. ¿Y qué hemos visto en la charla de la más? Bueno, hemos hablado un poco del contexto de ciberseguridad a nivel regional, a nivel mundial. Hemos visto tendencias, hasta hemos hablado de, de aspectos que pueden sonar un tanto futuristas. Hablamos de cómo hasta podemos esperar que la inteligencia artificial el día de mañana pueda generar ataques contra las organizaciones. Y cómo todo este contexto, sin dudas, hace que como bancos centrales que estemos interesados en ayudar al sector financiero a desarrollar eh, mecanismos que nos permitan seguir manteniendo la estabilidad financiera. Por eso se ha destacado claramente de que lo que podemos esperar en el futuro es que regulaciones de este tipo se vayan fortaleciendo en los próximos años. De esta manera queremos dar concluida esta charla. Les recordamos que los que se hayan inscrito mediante... Eh, 
sistema lo tenemos en el Instituto de SP, podrán descargar sus certificados de aquí a unos días. Y los que no lo hayan hecho, no se preocupen, pueden escribirnos a instituto.sp.gov.pi y ahí también les estaremos enviando sus certificados. Una vez más, muchísimas gracias a más. Y también muchas gracias a todos los que nos acompañaron en esta charla. Muchas gracias.